I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. This month of December on Constant Wonder, we've been on a journey called Advent. Our podcast's Advent calendar has been a series of daily episodes beginning on the 1st and leading all the way forward to the 25th. We've been welcoming special guests who have been sharing with us the wonder and the awe that are central to the spirit of this season. It's our way of spreading not only good cheer, but also peace, goodwill, and, of course, awe before all creation. It's December 15th. For this episode, we're going to take a momentary detour, just a couple of minutes as we get going, for some flat-out fun. Professional storyteller Kevin Kling has always been full of mischief. Let's just get that out there. You also need to know that from birth, his left arm has been much shorter than his right, and it has no wrist or thumb. So he's always worn a hard brace to support that hand. But the disability and the hand brace have never really slowed Kevin down. Even as a kid, he knew how to leverage the situation for a little bit of pranking. Not long ago, Kevin Kling came by our studios here at BYU Radio for a live taping with a studio audience. This was for our sister show called The Appleseed. And for that audience, he painted a picture of some wintertime antics. When we were kids, we were learning to ski, right? And to get to the top of the hill, we would take what's called the rope toe. Do you have rope toes here? You know, okay, so you know what these are. So you grab onto the rope, and it pulls you to the top of the hill, and then you slide back down. Well, at the bottom of the hill was a huge sign that said, absolutely no long hats, long scarves, or woolly mittens allowed on the rope toe. And my brother and I are standing there in our long hats, long scars, woolly mittens. <laughs> they don't mean us. And I grabbed onto the rope, and when I got to the top, I found out why that sign was there, because the rope twists as it goes up the hill. And if you're wearing woolly mittens, they twist into the rope. They actually become part of the rope toe. So I get to the top of the hill, and I go to let go, but I can't, because my mittens have woven into the rope. I pull my right arm free, but my left arm was not coming free, and it's starting to lift me up off the ground. I think, man, I've got to do something here. So I just let go of my brace, and my brace flies off my arm, and it's flying through the air. Well, the woman behind me sees it and says, oh my, it's his arm. And <laughs> she's down, and people are piling into her. So we did the rope toe trick the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that right there is what I'm talking about. A prime example of Kevin able to see a golden opportunity where other people generally would not. As an adult, Kevin Clean got going on a hobby. He loved to rebuild and ride antique motorcycles which might come as a surprise to you, given that one of his arms is in a brace. But he had the controls customized to accommodate his unique needs. Like I said, nothing really stops him. Now, this is where we get back to some more contemplative fare for Advent, with a story told the way that only Kevin Kling can tell it. First, a little bit of background for you. On August 11, 2001, when he was in his 40s, Kevin was riding his favorite antique motorcycle through an intersection when another driver failed to see him and turned right into his path. He flew into the car, slid along the pavement, using, as a nurse put it, his face as an airbag. As a result of the crash, his right arm suffered severe neurological damage. Try as they might, the surgeons never could restore any movement in that arm. A month went by, and still he hadn't been able to leave the hospital. In fact, he was still there on 9-11. It was after these giant, traumatic events, exactly one month apart from each other. The first, obviously a personal trauma, and the second, involving deep pain for the whole nation, that he wrote a story about prayer, and he shared it with us here on the Constant Wonder Podcast. We think it's the kind of story that's just right for the Advent and Christmas season. So this story is called The Three Phases of Prayer. And the first phase is when you're a kid and you're praying to get things. And I'm thinking of this especially as my family would always drive from uh, Minnesota to Missouri to spend Christmas with my grandparents. And we get in the Impala station wagon, my brother and I looking out of the back window and my sister in the middle, mom and dad up front. We'd be going through Iowa 
And my mom singing, what did I away, boys? What did I away? And we'd sing, she way to Washington, mom, she way to Washington. Mom had a song for every state in the union. Her song for Wisconsin goes, uh, I love to live in Wisconsin and smell the dairy air. So we're going through Wisconsin, and I take a moment to pray to God, to ask Jesus to tell Santa to bring me a squirrel monkey for Christmas. I thought, I'll go down the, the hierarchy of power and get that squirrel monkey. And But I never did. I never got a squirrel monkey just as much as I prayed. And so that was the first phase of prayer, though, getting something. Well, then my prayers changed when I was in college, and they changed to get me out of this. One example is I was uh, on this island at, called Eos in the Mediterranean, and I wanted to get back to Athens. This was between my junior and senior year of college. And I'm on Eos, and I reach in my pocket, and, oh, man, I only have $20 left, and I still want to see Italy and Ireland. So I decided to stow away on this boat, and I did. I stowed away. I, they never even looked for tickets. And I'm sitting next to this guy from France, and I go, hey, man, they didn't even look for tickets. I bought this boat for free. And he goes, well, they haven't even come around yet. They're going to come around a little bit. And he says, when they find you, he said, this happened to friends of mine. They're going to take you below and beat you with socks full of bars of soap because for some reason that doesn't show bruises. I'm like, well, no, they won't. I'm an American. Oh, he says, they're going to love you. And so sure enough, these guys come up looking for tickets, and I hide behind these barrel-looking depth charge things, but they saw my shoes. So they blow this whistle, and now it's cat and mouse on top of the deck. And I saw this rope ladder hanging over the side of the deck, and I climbed on the ladder, and I'm looking for land. I just said, if I see land anywhere, I'm just dropping in and swimming for it. And I, and I start to pray. I had not prayed in years, and I started to pray, please, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this, and I promise I'll never do anything this stupid again as long as I live. And I'm Russian, wild Russian boar hunting in Texas. They brought wild Russian boar. These things weigh like 500, 600 pounds, and you hunt them in the middle of the night because they eat meat at night, which is you. So we're hunting these boars in the middle of the night, and I'm what's called the light man. I've got a flashlight, and my job is to shine the light on the boar and then the guide, Mario, will shoot it. Well, I go, Mario, aren't they going to come with the, for the guy with the light? He goes, yeah. So I decide right then and there, if I see a wild Russian boar, I'm going to shine the light on Mario. Ooh, there's a big one. Well, Mario, finally, he just lays down and falls asleep on his rifle. And I'm out there in the middle of Texas waiting for a wild Russian boar to come and eat me. And I start to pray. I pray, please, God, please get me out of this. Get me out of this. And I promise I'll never do anything this stupid again as long as I live. And I'm at Mardi Gras. Okay, we know where that one's going. So my prayer shifted for the third and final time when I was in the hospital after my accident. And I'm in the hospital, and 9-11 happens in the United States. And I watch as our country goes through the same symptoms of post-traumatic stress that I'm going through. We all go through from anger to vengeance to denial. And every day... I would take the elevator down to the bottom floor and try to walk a half a block. That's all the further I could make it. And one day I get in the elevator and there's this kid, probably eight years old, and he turns to me and he says, I hit my head on a fence post and I had to get eight stitches here. He points to the back of his head. I go, oh yeah? I said, I had to get stitches here to here. I go around my head, down one arm and down one leg to the floor. The kid looks at me and says, yeah, but mine really hurt. He's got me. You can never judge another man's pain. So I get to the bottom floor. I take my half block walk and I come back and my wife, Mary, is standing there and she's got an apple. She goes, you got to try these. These are the best apples. I, Mary, I know I, th it just doesn't sound good. See, I don't know if you've ever been intubated or not, but you just lose flavor. Food has no flavor and I'd lost all interest. I was losing a lot of weight and Mary was worried. So she says, please, just try it for me. Okay. So I take a bite, and that was the day flavor returned. And I felt this sweetness hit my tongue. And when the sweetness hit my tongue, I started to cry. I had not cried in years. And as the tears flushed out all the antibiotics and toxins, I, my eyes started to burn. But between the burning in my eyes and the sweetness in my mouth, it felt so good to be alive. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's the day my prayers shifted to prayers of thanks. And I don't know whether good things started to happen to me because I was noticing them or, or because I was saying thank you, but it doesn't matter. Every day I see blessings in my curses. 
Every day, somebody helps me, and I'm here to say nobody looks better than when they're helping somebody. So I'll be at home with Mary, and we're sitting there. Our wiener dogs are there. Wiener dogs really help me a lot because you'll never see a more can-do attitude and a more can't-do body than a wiener dog. And, uh, and oh, and our bass and hound, we had our bass and hound. Uh, when the breeder dropped him off, he was 10 weeks old, and she goes, now, when it comes to training bass and hounds, they start out slow, but then they taper off. So... We got him, we're looking in the fire, and uh, I'm at such peace that I take a moment to pray to God, to ask Jesus to tell Santa, if there's one thing I want, it's to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Or a squirrel monkey. (laughs) The ever-popular storyteller, Kevin Kling, recorded during a visit to our studios here at BYU Radio. You can find both of these stories in Season 3, Episode 2 of Constant Wonder. Thanks for joining with us on this 15th day of our audio Advent calendar. Tenery Taylor was producer for this installment in the ongoing series. Tenery had help from Lily Jensen, and sound design was by James Call and Carly Wilson. If you missed any of the earlier daily Advent drops, you can find the whole kitten caboodle that's a phrase I use because I can imagine Kevin Kling using it, at byuradio.org, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tomorrow, we'll learn about Jesus' hometown, a little more than a village, really. When you know a little bit about the character of the place, it's pretty clear why Nathaniel in the New Testament would pose the question, the famous question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.